introduce you to Katie Miller and uh, she's going to talk to us about educating girls um, about FOSS with FOSS. Can I put them behind Katie's? Here we go. Uh, Katie says that many believe in a key strategy for increasing the number of women in IT and open source is to educate girls about computing at a young age. So she's been doing this with IBM and she'd like to talk to us about her experiences. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> so yes, I'm Katie and I want to cover today just some of my experiences running two particular workshops on open source using open source tools for teenage girls and most importantly, the lessons I learned along the way. So I want to briefly explain why I think running this kind of workshop is worthwhile uh, and where the opportunity came from before uh, going through the kind of general approach I took and then uh, how each of the workshops actually ran and I'll demo a couple of the tools that were used uh, before ending with some tips and recommendations to help anyone else uh, that might be wanting to try this kind of thing. So to start off with, here are some statistics that probably won't be too unfamiliar for people in this room, but as we know, a bit of an issue with women in IT generally and particularly in open source according to those statistics uh, definitely doesn't reflect the general demographic so we've got yeah, less than 20% of grads 25% of the workforce I couldn't find a stat for Australian CIOs but only 9% of US CIOs are women and that number has been falling and just generally uh, in the Australian workplace with ASX 200 companies only 15% of board members are women so I don't think anyone has the silver bullet for this problem. I um, don't really know exactly what the answer is, but it is quite widely believed that girls are getting turned off IT at a pretty young age. Uh, so one thing we can do is try to educate them uh, in high school or even primary school. And so one opportunity to do that is IBM's annual Excite Camps. Excite is Exploring Interests in Technology and Engineering. So they run them uh, every year over normally about three days uh, and the aim is to fuel interest in these kind of subject areas so maths and technology and science and uh, uh, there seems to be a bit of a focus on Queensland I asked them they say they do also run them in Sydney and Melbourne but we had three of them in Queensland last year so we're quite privileged I guess in that way uh, at Nathan Logan and on the Gold Coast and they mostly consist of workshops. Uh, there are sometimes some site visits to cool tech companies or whatnot, but it's mostly workshops and mostly of about an hour each. So you've only got one hour to capture these girls' attention. So when I um, got the email asking me if I wanted to take part uh, last year, there were already quite a few workshops slated. We had topics like uh, sustainable living, uh, image processing, social networking, identity protection, robotics, so quite a range of quite good topics there. Uh, I decided, uh, given that I work for Red Hat, that I'd like to do something on open source and use Red Hat's uh, PASS platform as a service, uh, which is called OpenShift, to do so. So I called mine open source in the cloud. Uh, and now, OpenShift has quite a number of what they call cartridges, which allow you to just get started quite quickly on your app. Uh, so there's cartridges for Django and Rails and quite a number of things. One of them I noticed though was WordPress. So I decided to go with this because it was something that uh, you could get up and running quickly and you didn't need to actually do any code. Um, because WordPress is open source, the code's all there, you know, you can get a working blog in about 30 seconds. Uh, so I thought, it's probably better to go with that rather than getting them to actually code something in Rails or whatnot. And I realised going through this process, I hadn't really used OpenShift uh, that much myself before, before trying this out, that it covers quite a lot of topic areas. Uh, so you've got the cloud, obviously you've got to talk about that, uh, blogging, using the terminal. And if you actually want to edit the source code, you've got to use Git, so you've got version control systems there, you've got SSHing, so you've got encryption, a uh, little bit of programming. So there's quite a number of topic areas that it looks at, which I thought, great, sweet, you know, one topic and you can cover all these different things. <laughs> Uh, which I actually found out a bit later is a bit of a trap, but yeah, there's a, there was a lot of great things that you could touch on in doing this. Uh, I also um, thought, because in previous years, it wasn't my first Excite Camps last year, I'd done one the year prior, and I did an Android app uh, workshop using App Inventor, and someone suggested to me that 
it's good to drip feed the students with the instructions. If you give them it all at once, they can get demotivated. Um, so what I did the first year, uh, as had been suggested to me, was give them out um, on pieces of paper, one at a time though. So you do piece of paper one, finish that, then come out and get number two. And that was great, I think it worked reasonably well, except that I spent a lot of time giving out pieces of paper, <laughs> which made it quite hard to answer questions and you know, deal with some of the problems they were having. So this time around, I thought, well, Maybe I can automate this. Um, so I was using WordPress, so I thought, okay, I'll make a WordPress site um, that has the instructions on it. And yeah, so I was aiming to actually replace the paper with that. And finally, uh, the labs I had access to dual booted with Windows and Ubuntu, so being an open source workshop, I thought, great, I'll make them use Ubuntu. So, take one. So I created my WordPress site, uh, I had five sections, each of those sections had a set of instructions, a little bit of a write-up on those topics that I mentioned earlier, so I picked out five topics and wrote a little bit ab about them and I thought we'll try to make it quite a fun style, uh, and also a quiz. So the idea of the quiz was to make it uh, enforced, I guess, that it was sequential, so they couldn't get to the second set of instructions before they'd at least done the quiz from the first. And to do that, I used uh, a couple of plugins. The login configurator, which just makes uh, forces that you must log in while using the site to view anything but the home page. And also a plugin I found called the WP Survey and Quiz Tool. I was actually surprised um, WordPress didn't seem to have that many great quiz plugins available, and I had to hack this quiz tool quite a bit to get it to do what I wanted. Um, but regardless, yeah, those two together met that need. Uh, and another thing I guess that's significant to mention for this first iteration is that section one was basically uh, used to get the girls setting up a cloud email account, so you talk about that, and an OpenShift account. So there was, a, I guess, we farmed out some of the admin to them by making it part of the workshop, uh, which turned out to be quite a bad idea. <laughs> we had uh, email, you know, confirmation emails being lost, girls forgetting what their password was to their school, you know, cloud email, all of that kind of thing. So I'll give you just a quick idea, I can pull this up, what it looked like. So this is the first workshop site, it's the home screen, if we can get focus here. Um, so you can see it starts with a big chunk of text uh, and we've got a link here and by clicking the link that's how you get started. Uh, unfortunately, I found that girls don't tend to read so much so <laughs> there was problem one. Uh, we've got the five sections across the top here. Uh, if I go into one, hopefully this loads, you can see what it looks like. So we've got a series of instructions, a big chunk of text about something, in this case cloud computing, so trying to give them a bit of information about the topic, and then a quiz. So you've got to pass that to be able to get to section two. And uh, actually, also show you, if I can get this going here, um, what the actual process they went through looked like in general. So I've recorded this to avoid the issues with live demos. Um, so this is the OpenShift site and this, is, this isn't sped up, so this is about how long it takes. So there are all the cartridges that you can choose. Uh, you can see we've got WordPress there. So select that. Um, you're required to come up with a name for your blog uh, or your app and also a namespace, although mine's already pre-selected there. Um, and that's about it. And it, it is about, um, which unfortunately I can't fast forward in a GIF. Um, and that website is there. Uh, I guess worth mentioning on um, looking at this GIF that it is another tool I actually ended up using within the workshops. So this is, I think, Byzan's applet is the name of it. It's a great way to quickly record things on your desktop. So the girls had to go through this process, and this bit wasn't too bad. I mean, this is pretty GUI oriented. There you go, the app is done. And then, voila, you have a blog instantly. Images don't render so well on the GIF there with the high res. Um, so we got them to go into the kind of GUI side of WordPress where you can uh, edit posts and all that kind of thing, uh, which is fine. Uh, but if you actually want to change the code of the site permanently or do something like add a new plugin, you've got to go to Git. So I wasn't, there wasn't really a way of shielding them from that. 
So we'd go through that, there you go, it's easy to make changes. And then we went to kind of the next level. I guess that was the first level, get us getting a blog started in the first place. And then they were required to actually clone the repo and uh, make a change. I didn't get them to actually do any coding. It was basically just changing uh, a variable value and then seeing that change on the site. So the idea is just to kind of give them the idea that, I mean, in the GUI you can see you make a change in the admin section and it's reflected in the actual blog, but when you make a change here in the source code, you can make a change anywhere. You can make a change in the admin section to kind of, you know, give them that idea that the whole source code is available and you can hack any piece of it. Uh, so yeah, there we are going in there and changing the name of the dashboard to, what do we change it to, page of power, I think. <laughs> uh, again, of course, up to them in all of these cases, what they wanted to do, do a commit, and in a couple of seconds, once we push, open shift rebuild, you've got action hooks there that you can hook into as well. And then we've got yeah, SSH, so they're uh, required to... We had um, the tools that this uses uh, already set up on the machines, but they still needed to go through a little process to set up the public key and whatnot. So there's still, you know, all those different areas to touch on. You know, what is SSH? Why are we bothering this? What is Git? Quite a lot of things. I guess you don't realise that uh, as a computer literate person, you know, there are quite a number of leaps here. Uh, and there we go, if we go to our admi admin section, you can see, voila, it has been changed. So that's a basic run through of what they were doing, just in general. So, how did it go? Well, some things went well. Uh, I think the girls really enjoyed getting uh, creative. I found, um, you know, when it popped up and says, uh, write in your WordPress bio and all this kind of thing, which wasn't at all important for the workshop, quite a lot of them loved that, you know, they got excited and writing their life story in this box. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, definitely uh, really got into that. Uh, I saw some of the girls in the terminal typing in things like LOL and OMG and, you know, laughing at the results, um, that kind of thing. So, yeah, just testing it out. Um, also, they all had their first exposure to Linux. They all said they'd never used it before. And by the end of it, someone was saying, yeah, I can imagine using this as my operating system. So I thought that was a real positive. Uh, they loved the prizes. <laughs> we, we had a prize for the person that got the furthest and also free stuff for everyone. And I wouldn't have thought 14-year-old girls would get that excited about, you know, oversized T-shirts and caps, but they loved it. They were trying the caps every which way, really got into that. So that was definitely a win. Uh, the web-based instructions meant that they had something to take away with them and they could hack on their blog later. I don't have any way of knowing whether they continued with their blogs, unfortunately, but I did see some activity on the instruction site after the workshop. So that was really encouraging. And, uh, yeah, finally, just having helpers. It wasn't just me. I had three other Red Hatters there with me to help answer all those questions. And we were kept busy the entire hour. You know, you really need those people there with you. So, as far as I knew, that was it. I'd done the workshop, over and done with. And I wrote a blog about it and kind of the agile spirit. I did a retrospective, what went well, uh, what didn't go so well, what, what should I do differently next time. Then, of course, as, just after I'd publicly committed to that, I got the email saying, do you want to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> so, then I had to yeah, get my butt into gear and actually do all those things that I said I would do differently next time. So, we went on to... Oh, grab focus. Workshop... Oh, Ah, I'm afraid I missed my lessons learned. <laughs> um, so I'll quickly go through that. Yeah, so I guess one of the big downsides was the content. Too much content. All those great topics we can cover and way too much for an hour. Um, I found that, yeah, teens just don't read. I think I had a girl just look to me and was like, I can't read that much text. Like, you know, it's just too much. It was overwhelming. And I guess, yeah, that probably depends a lot on the group, but as well, but I just found in general, you know, they really didn't like having to read through something. Um, switching windows and tabs was a bit of an issue that we didn't think about. It required them to have, you know, the OpenShift site open in one window, the WordPress in another, the instructions in another. That caused a few problems um, and also had girls losing windows in other workspaces and whatnot. We didn't really give them much training about how to use Ubuntu. Um, yeah, so there were quite a few issues there. Uh, we also found, yeah, they all follow whatever is on screen. 
So if it says put an SSH key in this box, even though the instructions don't mention that, they will try to put something in that box <laughs> and then wonder why it doesn't work. So yeah, we just found whatever's on screen, they will follow. So we needed some way of mitigating that. And also though, as I mentioned, a lot were very creative. There are also girls who really struggled whenever they were required to come up with a value. So just something like the namespace, for example. So we realised we probably needed example values for everything. So those people who weren't so creative had something that they could just chuck in the box. So, take two. Alright, so the first thing, cutting down content. Uh, I went down to three sections, uh, this time each with the instructions and a quiz still, but they now had a slideshow. So rather than a big chunk of text, something a bit more interactive, a bit more fun. Uh, I also set up all the OpenShift accounts in advance this time, so we weren't wasting any time on that. And uh, we had uh, more images, so I'm not that much of a graphic designer, but I discovered the Open Clip Art Library, which has heaps of great uh, free SVGs and also Inkscape. So using those two together, I was able to create cartoons to tell the story for some of those concepts. Uh, and also had DZ slides to actually run the slideshows, and also Thumb Sniper, which I found to do screenshots on Hover. So through those instructions, wherever there was uh, a new, I guess, stage in the process. I took a screenshot and had it available there on Hover. So much more guidance this time. We're able to mitigate things like the SSH box problem by putting a big X there. You know, do not put anything in here. So I'll show you what it looks like. Where are we? Here we go. This is workshop take two. So it doesn't look that much different in style. I use the same theme. Oh. Hang on, get that back. The same theming, um, but that problem I talked about with the link in the chunk of text, uh, not a problem anymore. Pretty obvious how to get started. Uh, so that was one major improvement. Uh, now we just have the three sections. Uh, pick one of these to have a look at. We also have challenges. That was just, you know, if it was too short and people needed extra things to get into. Better navigation, so now things like this, you know, showing how to advance. And here's an example of one of the slideshows. So now, sort of the text, we just have kind of short, punchy points, uh, pictures. Oh, that's one of my cartoons. So a little bit cheesy, but still gets the point across in a way that they'll actually look at and read, um, rather than just a big chunk of text. And also, I guess there's a lot better use of colour in this format as well, but also had the animated GIF, as I mentioned before, so something, yeah, a little bit more exciting to look at to explain these concepts and you actually demonstrate them there. Uh, so I mentioned the Open Clip Art Library. I uh, thought I might just show it quickly for anyone that hasn't seen it. So here's an example of if you type in cat, you get things like this, and you can see those cats there that I've used, all ready-made ready to go and yeah something like button there we go and go to quickly to Inkscape sound like people are fairly familiar with it already but if anyone isn't I wasn't too familiar with it before I mean it's like a Photoshop program it's really not so intimidating at all surprised how easy it is to use um, so you know we select something like this changing a color oh, it'd be helpful if I selected the whole thing but you know you get the idea it's pretty simple uh, and for those who are more inclined to avoid GUIs, you can even just go in and edit it. I mean, that's my SVG. So it's pretty awesome. <laughs> I was, yeah, pre pretty pleased to discover that as part of this process. So this time, how did it go? Much, much better, I think, much more smoothly. Uh, the previous time, actually, only. <coughs> One girl, the, the girl we declared the winner got to the end of about section four or five, so no one actually finished, only one girl really made it to the terminal, although the others were still playing with the terminal. This time I think almost everyone was at least on the final section and I think at least half the room actually finished, so that was a much better result. 
um, the students were asking a lot of questions this time. Uh, so we had people, you know, what is source code? You know, what is, they really wanted to kind of go a little bit deeper with it, which I thought was a real positive. Um, they also, again, went beyond the instructions and wanted to customise. We had, um, I think, the Pop My Afro blog with these, you know, great Afro pictures and all these different things that they came up with, even though the instructions didn't explicitly say you had to do that. Uh, and also this time I had a web survey, so those who did finish had the chance to uh, do that. Well, any of them could have done that, but it was only ones that finished that got to it. Uh, and that really just gave really invaluable feedback. So some of that feedback is reflected here. I've cut down some of these questions a little bit from the originals, but to give you some idea. So, had you heard of open source? Only 18% said yes. Had you heard of Linux? 45. Had you used Linux? None of them. So, that was great. Uh, I asked them how likely in the next three months it would be uh, that they download and try Linux now that they'd heard about it. 73% uh, said likely, 9% honest enough to say no chance. <laughs> um, and I think the last statistic is probably the, represents the biggest challenge for me. I asked them, outside of school time, would you be interested in doing a workshop in programming? And 91% of those answered said yes. And I think about 10 gave me email addresses to contact them. So a big opportunity there. And here's just a few of their comments that they wrote in the free text kind of sections. Um, so yeah, it kind of reflects, they, it was fast, you know, they didn't always know exactly what they were doing, um, but they got that feeling of being like a computer hacker, and, you know. <laughs> so they at least enjoyed that. <laughs> Uh, so lessons learned this time, I think there's a really delicate balance between minimising the content and then also providing enough to give them enough information about things. So the fact they were asking more questions is in one way good and another way reflects maybe you know they hadn't quite got enough there. I saw some trying to scroll up in their terminal history and change the past and things like that that you know, just showed that maybe it wasn't quite all there. Uh, I think making things as foolproof as possible. One issue we had is I had all these terminal commands with the sample prompt and a lot of them would copy and paste the command with the prompt and then wonder why it wasn't working. So I think perhaps in future maybe making it another colour or even better making it an image so it's not possible to copy paste. Yeah, make it foolproof would have been a good idea. And yeah, I guess there's always going to be issues. We never saw that prompt thing coming. So you just have to have the helpers on hand and anticipate that, that something will go wrong. So you've got to you know, have the resources ready to do something about it. Ooh, too far. So overall, I guess I would say if you're doing something like this, try to communicate through uh, images and more interactive styles as much as possible. Um, yeah, text just doesn't seem to be the best medium. Avoid it if you can. Uh, making the content, content interactive and allowing uh, creativity. It seemed in both workshops, even though it was kind of technically a race, there was a prize for the people that finished first. They always just wanted, they wanted to take the time and slow down and customise and get creative, which is great, so might as well harness that. I think doing a dry run with someone from the exact target demographic is a great idea. We did do dry runs, but not with someone who was 14 years old. And I think it's just easy as someone that's been using computers for a long time to skip steps. Things that seem obvious to you are just not obvious to someone who's never seen a terminal before. Like, you know, why can't you change the past? You know, that kind of thing. So I think the only way to find those things is to do that kind of dry run. I think definitely making it fun is an obvious one. And maybe considering making it competitive. I don't know if I'd necessarily say that worked that well with those groups or not, but at least gave them the motivation to move forward. And we didn't have too many girls sitting in the corner using Facebook or anything like that. So it was motivational. And I think finally, just expecting the unexpected. Things will go wrong. You learn from it. You iterate. Um, yeah, so you've got to have people ready to deal with that. Uh, Oh, great. Plenty of time. Uh, <laughs> I've got some links there. So these, ooh, these slides, uh, link is there, uh, links to the two sites. Also some blogs I wrote on the experiences I went and some of the different technologies that we used. Uh, yeah, well, credit to the, the photos that you've been seeing through the presentation uh, taken by Dale and David and just the people that helped me on the day. And that's about it. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? The actual format, is that them following their own instructions and you answering questions, or were you actually giving lectures and telling them about the technology they've been using, for instance, GIG? 
Yeah, yeah um, no, so it's just the web-based instructions. I didn't do any standing up the front and talking other than an introduction at the start. Um, so yeah, they just followed along and then asked for help when they needed it. Yeah, I got the mic. Um, might be slightly out of the scope of your talk, but I work at a university where they do run the Excite. Um, the next step to that is getting the enrolments into the university, and there's a worrying, worrying trend in that, and numbers do reflect exactly what you said there. We get maybe one or two uh, female students who go the IT path. But once they're in, um, it's really hard to keep them in that mode. I often lose them off to, you know, um, doing artwork or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but some of my best students are the female students in coding. Um, even though it's only one or two, they're always in the top four or five. Is there any way uh, that you can think of, or any tips, on to help keep them motivated down the track of coding and how wonderful text terminals are and <laughs> how much better it is than drawing pictures? Awesome. Um, especially when we've got staff that have no female staff at all. Mm. Well, that's probably one of the problems. If there aren't mentors or people they can look up to, uh, I mean, I can't really answer that definitively. I can say for me, I always like coding, and I think what kept me going was wanting to find out how to do whatever it is I was trying to achieve. So you have a project, you want to make some website, you need it to do whatever, so you know that motivates you to then go look in the code, how do I write code that does that? And I think, I don't know, that's all I can say. I think if you can find something that they're engaged in, some kind of project, whatever it may be, uh, and that gets them then hooked into that cycle. And you just have to learn. You know, if you want to achieve that, you have to learn more. Um, but yeah, I can't say definitively. I think every person's different and coding probably isn't for everyone. Uh, but yeah, for myself, I think that was part of what got me hooked anyway. Um, I do have a question, but first, what's wrong with digital art? Get them to do that, and then you keep them in digital, and you keep them in art. It's perfect, <laughs> says the obvious bias. Um, <laughs> Um, how did you access the, the participants? I mean, was it something that you had a, a community who had been given to you, or did you have to go out and drum up the interest and bring them in, or how, how was that process managed? Uh, so IBM managed all of that, but they just do it uh, with the school. So I think there were girls from four different schools in each of the workshop, just from that local area. Um, so yeah, the IBM people went about organ that. I'm just wondering uh, how many girls were involved and do you think that the size of the group made a, a big difference? Uh, about two dozen in each case. Uh, and I think, yeah, any bigger, and it probably would have been pretty difficult to manage. They worked well like that. In one, uh, in the second workshop, there weren't enough machines for the girls, so some of them had to work in pairs, but I think that actually worked quite well. Um, so that'd be another interesting thing to experiment with. Um, did you notice a mind shift to open source software? Because I know with schools, most of them are going through the Photoshops and the, the Windows platforms. Is there much of a mind shift during that session or is it something that they would need to revisit later on? Um, I think it's hard in one hour to cause a, a more permanent mind shift, but I think, yeah, you're right. They're not getting that in school. I mean, we know there's deals done with all the big companies so that the software doesn't often make it into the schools. Um, so I guess just getting some exposure is a good thing. If any of those girls actually did go home and download Linux, then that's a good thing. Well, that's kind of where I was going to go as well. There's the bridge between what you're doing and what you're talking about getting the girls in university. Is there any follow through with these girls? Uh, apart, you know, are you working, you say it's IBM that arranged it, is there any way of following through and keeping these girls, once you've got them excited about it, to, to help keep them going through the path to get to university? to try and get those numbers up yeah. as well? Uh, well, I guess one opportunity is I do have email addresses for a bunch of girls uh, willing to do a coding workshop, so I'm looking to organise uh, one of those. And also IBM's been pretty good. I've asked them about if they can help me get participants if I run workshops, say, on the Gold Coast or different places, and, yeah, they're keen to help out. So they've already got the contacts, so, yeah, definitely a good way to get the girls. Um, so I'm going to stand up for this one. Um, since the question has been asked twice, um, I, Cody's, um, Katie's actually a member of Girl Geek Coffees, which is um, supporting female students in early career. Males are most certainly invited to come as well. Um, 
and that actually find like minds to talk geek or whatever that may be, that may be art geek, um, that may be coding geek, information systems, whatever else, to actually be proud of um, expressing your geeky slash nerdiness in the appropriate way and to actually keep them retaining, retained in their, um, within their studies to find people that are interested in what they're interested in. So to those two people that ask the question, I've given my card, please see me after if you want my card and to learn more about it. Um, Girl Geek Coffees. Um, just as a follow-up through with the university questions and things like that, have you ever thought that um, you could get these young girls into sort of thinking, hey, I can use this programming skills and these new operating systems to have an achievement at the end of it, sort of saying, you know, I could make a program that does say hello world or whatever, and, you know, maybe even tie that into whatever their interests are. I mean, as our presenter down the front pointed out, why not mix digital art in mm. together? Have you ever thought that that would be the way to run the programs in the future, to give that them and set the extra incentive over the top? Yeah, I don't, can't say I've specifically thought about that, but I think if you had a longer time, that would be definitely a good approach to take, so that at the end of the day they can go off and try that. I think in an hour it's difficult to find anything that is going to suit everyone, because you will have girls you know, with different interests. Um, but yeah, definitely a good idea for, I think, a longer workshop that would be a great idea, try and get them, or maybe even something like Girls Programming Network, uh, but with a project, so they come every week, or that kind of thing. I think that would be a great strategy. So they're one hour workshops. Are the girls getting bored? Is there any reason you aren't extending that to possibly two hours or maybe even half a day? Uh, that was just a restriction of the Excite format. So I don't think any of the workshops are longer than an hour and a half. And yeah, this, this slot that I got was only an hour. Oh. Uh, I don't think they were bored, no. I mean, they seem pretty engaged. I think only in the first workshop maybe we had one or two girls that were trying to slip onto Facebook. Um, but yeah, uh, all the rest seemed to be pretty pretty good. So yeah, I think it could work definitely over a longer format. And that's what I'd probably do if I did do a, a workshop now with those girls that have responded, probably do a whole day. Yeah, I just had a quick comment. I'm, I'm also part of the program that Katie does. I teach Lego um, Lean software, the same thing, and uh, IBM do an awesome job. I just want to say, though, they really struggle to find women to actually help like, do what Katie does, and I always felt a bit weird than the guy doing this thing. Um, so um, we can help you put, in, put you in touch with these people. They really, really want women to help them out. And I, I think it should be all women facilitators, really. This shouldn't be people like me doing it, but it's just pragmatic. They just have to have someone do it. So. Mm. It was just all I was going to say, really. And they do, um, uh, I think they do a, a um, scholarship, IBM do, specifically for women to actually um, help them through uni, and I think they actually give them potentially a job afterwards as well. There's a couple of girls that I've met that are part of that. So. I'd, I'd just say, I have the contact details for the person. If you are interested in participating in an Excite workshop, um, come and see me and I'll give you the email address that you need. Just on that point, I think it's actually really important that guys feel comfortable in contributing to these programs um, because there aren't many women. There's about 5% female coders and expecting them to save the world while saving themselves is logistically a nightmare. Um, and to actually, being a male, to actually feel comfortable contributing to these female specific, well, female targeted zones um, and to actually create that discussion amongst yourselves, how would you how would you approach this? Okay. Thank you very much.